Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really brilliant to be here. It's such a pleasure and it's so good to see so many of you able to come today. Uh, one of the uh, absolute joys, I'm head of the Division of Nursing, Midwifery and Social Work at the University of Manchester. And one of the joys of my job is our close collaboration with the Trust. It's uh, absolutely fantastic. I think we, we both need each other and we work really well together. So it's really good to be here. Um, so what I plan to talk about, can you, hear, can you all hear me okay? Is everything, yeah. Um, <laughs> why are most research findings false? How can we make more research findings that are true? How can we make more research useful? And how can we increase the chance that that useful research actually gets used? Because just because we go and do that research and we think we've done it well, and it was a really good idea in the first place, doesn't mean to say it gets used. So that's the plan for the next 20 minutes or so. So I don't think I need to persuade anybody in this room, probably, why we need to do research and why we need to use it. Oh, by the way, I should have said at the beginning, totally happy for you to tweet or don't take any pictures of me, but <laughs> that, you know, I'm, not, I'm not revealing anything uh, confidential here. Um, you're all signed up to the idea of why do we do research and why it's important to use it. I think one of the things I want to emphasise today for the professions here in the room is that we share a lot of things in common that put us in a brilliant position to really make a difference. We've come into these professions because we care and because we're motivated to give the best care that we can. We are, generally speaking, really ideally placed to make sure that research evidence gets into practice. We're right at the interface with patients, with health service users, with members of the public. We can really make it happen. We're almost the last link in the chain very often. So that's a brilliant place to be if we care about getting evidence into practice. And the other thing, I don't know um, about your experiences, and you'll all have very different experiences, but, but most, if not all of you, will know what it feels like to be uncertain, and uncertain about what the best way of, of managing a particular clinical situation is, and not necessarily knowing whether there's any research to support that uncertainty or not, and feeling, you know, what should I do? And we know, and research has shown time and time again, that in those particular circumstances, all clinicians turn to colleagues. They don't turn to research necessarily. But those uncertainties can be uncomfortable. We're all graduates, or we're all, um, if, we're not, if we don't have a degree, we're moving towards having a degree, or we're certainly working at that level anyway, which prepares us for using research in practice. And I think we all, all the health professions, including medicine, um, but particularly those of us in, in the room in other professions, we need a better evidence, evidence base to inform our practice. We're um, uh, uh, at a more uh, early stage of the development of research in our professions. And uh, medicine by no means has it all sorted, but we've got even more ground to make up. But the other thing that I absolutely love about doing research is it's really enriching. It makes you think. It makes you think about new things every day, think differently about things you thought you knew about. And it's huge fun. But I think we've just got to keep reminding ourselves, let's make the research that we do that that's likely to give us the right answer, that's, that's true, and that the research questions are useful in the first place and the research gets used. Otherwise, it's a massive waste of money. So I want to talk about a couple of my heroes and heroines. Um, I think it's important to have people that you kind of think, oh, they, they really got some amazing things right. We wouldn't be here on this day if it wasn't for Flo. It is her birthday, so happy birthday, Florence. She was born on the 12th of May, which is why we celebrate Nurses Day today. Um, we all know about the things that Florence did, but I think as I get older, things that I took for granted when I was young that I knew about her, the older I get, the more I think, wow. And even if there is quite a bit of debate about what, what role she really did have in the Crimean War, and there's historians that fall out about this, um, what, is, no, what nobody argues about is the way she approached statistics and data and rigour. 
and how she went about collecting and analysing data very carefully and in fact developed um, a way of presenting data, um, the Coxcomb kind of pie chart thing, it's a, an advanced pie chart, that we still use to this day. So it's pretty, you know, I'm, I am in awe. I'm not the greatest um, mathematician or even, I'm, I'm not even any good at arithmetic. So I am in awe of her. Uh, she was the first female member of the Royal Statistical Society and an honorary member of the American Statistical Association. And what she tried to do was use data to save lives and improve patient care way back then. And, I, you know, before computers. So she's amazing. So um, she's inspired me. And then this other unlikely looking hero continues to inspire me and continues to make me think differently about data and about research generally and about why we do it. And he's a chap called J John Ioannidis. He's a Greek guy who works at Stanford University in California, in America. He's a doctor, he's an epidemiologist. And he is one of the most highly cited and published scientists in the world. Um, he's got 647 publications. I don't know, um, I can't imagine how anyone finds the time. I think he's a couple of years younger than me. Um, and so he's amazing. And he's got one of the highest H indexes, which is a measure of how productive you've been and how often your papers are cited by other people in their publications of anyone. And on average, all of his papers are cited about 100 times. So he's amazing. But and I'm going to draw on his work a lot in, in this talk because I think he makes some amazing points that make, make go, OK, um, and makes us think much more deeply about what we do and why we do it in terms of in terms of research but he's a very unassuming kind of guy he's not one of these big ego guys and in fact uh, he's been my hero for ages and I didn't know what he looked like and I went to a conference in I don't know Germany a few years ago I've been in Spain I got the old blur and I was on a there was a conference dinner and myself and a colleague uh, from here Joe Dumble were on a late night train back to the conference hotel after this dinner we ran to get this train and there's this little unassuming guy and this other American guy and we got on the train and we sort of didn't really, we sort of passed time of day, we, you know, but we didn't really get engaged in conversation with them. Uh, I didn't know who they were. And then after, uh, I saw her later on in the, uh, a year or two later, a photo of this guy. That was the guy I was on the train with in the middle of the night after this conference dinner. And if I'd known it was him, I'd have gone up and said, can I have your autograph? <laughs> It would, all be, it would have ended badly. It would have been tremendously embarrassing. So it's probably just as well I didn't know it was him. Anyway, so this guy, anyway, he, he writes articles with titles like this. Why most published research findings are false. And if you spent your life doing research in health, that makes you go, huh? okay, really? And he writes really clearly as well. I mean, there's quite, there's quite a lot of stats in it, uh, uh, but, not, but, that, but actually it's the words are simple and the story he tells is clear. And, and he, um, so I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. But you can, you can imagine, it makes you feel quite undermined, doesn't it? Why most published research findings are false. Ha but then it comes back with a sequel, which makes you feel a bit happier. How to make more published research true? Good, thanks, John. And then, but why most <laughs> clinical research is not useful. Okay. So, um, but you can see he's got these great titles. They're hugely well-written pieces of work and stimulating and actually make you think about doing things a bit differently. Uh, so I'm going to draw a lot on his stuff. I'm not going to talk a lot about my research today because I, 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 I want to talk about the things that doing research has made me think differently about and reading other people has made me think differently about. So um, what John, John Ioannidis and other people have said it as well, but he says it in a, in a snappy, attention-grabbing way. Um, single studies gain a lot of attention in the media, but they are rarely conclusive. Really important, generally speaking, we don't change practice on the basis of one study or a Daily Mail headline heaven forbid. Um, so we all remember the whole MMR autism business and, and the people around the world are still paying for that now with measles epidemics. Um, and that 
paper that caused the, uh, the people to walk away from having the MMR vaccine was a case series, which isn't, is barely a research design at all, of about 12 children who happened to have had the MMR uh, and happened to have various gastrointestinal symptoms and, uh, and behavioural problems. And uh, so we should never have given that tiny speculative study the credence it, 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 deserve, it, uh, it won and didn't deserve and, you know, cost many lives, actually. So we don't listen to one study. We need to look at all the research addressing the same question. Uh, and we don't do that often enough. The other um, contention in John Ioannidis' paper, and, it, and I know this to be true, is most research is biased. That means it will tend to produce results that aren't true. This, this bias isn't intentional usually at all, but it's a design fault, design in planning a study, in collecting the data, in analysing it or presenting it. It's unintentional, but it gives the wrong answer. So we need to be much smarter about doing better research. And then those of us who uh, have to use research in our daily working lives, we need to be much smarter about only using the good stuff. Now, a lot of this talk um, I, um, is, is focusing on quantitative research more than qualitative. Both are really important. I've been involved in doing both. Uh, for most of the decisions that we use, certainly in nursing where we've analysed decision making in depth on a huge scale, most of the decisions that nurses make are about interventions. Uh, they might be small intervention or they might be big interventions, they might be about service configuration, but service configuration is an intervention of a type. And so intervention type issues require randomised control trials to address them by and large. Uh, and certainly they mainly require quantitative research. And what um, many people have shown over the years is that most quantitative studies are far too small to um, find any kind of difference going on between two comparisons at all. Um, and also, small studies are more likely to find the wrong answer. So there's a problem with sample size. Another big problem in science generally Repeating somebody else's work is not sexy. You do not get points for that usually. You get, uh, you know, there are lots of weird incentives that academics work with, m many of which are silly. And um, being original and doing something for the first time gets you the most kudos. Repeating somebody else's work carefully to see if it's replicable, which after all is a fundamental part of science, is not something you get a lot of credit for really but we all need people to replicate other people's work don't we because you know de facto we can't just go on one study so there's insufficient of that so this is straight from John Ioannidis's paper how to make more published research true um, and I'm not going to plow through these whole bullet points and some of them are more pertinent to this audience I think than others but um, the things that help make research more likely to get the right answer, the true answer. Things like large scale, big collaborative teams, replication, um, this notion of um, registering studies before you embark on them or just as you embark on them. So hands up in the room, anybody who's been involved in a clinical trial? Quite a few of you. Now, it's absolutely expected nowadays that clinical trials are registered right at the outset before a single patient is recruited into them and that the protocol, the plan for that trial, is placed somewhere, ideally, that's open and accessible. Um, because that's part of, of transparency. It's part of reducing unintended duplication. It's part of making sure people don't shift the goalposts as they go along. But other things that the community that I represent, the academic community, still finds very difficult. The health service is much better at, but academics are a bit, find it a little bit challenging, is sharing data and information and protocols. Because, there's some smiles going on around the room, because 
you know, again, we think, well, that's mine, and I've done that, and I want the credit for it, and if you want to use this for your evil empire, then I'm only going to give you it on my terms. And actually, that's no good anymore. If we recruit humans into our research, those humans have usually given their time and energy in order to benefit other humans. And we can't have these people gatekeeping that benefit, really. So we've got to change the culture, just as you have in the health service, to be more about sharing best practice, sharing information, sharing data, sharing plans for studies. We need to look at reproducibility more. We need to think about conflicts of interest more. I won't go into that, but that is a very hot topic. Uh, better statistics. It's all right doing the best study in the world and collecting the data really well. If you've not involved a statistician from the beginning in the design of that study and the plan for the analysis, it's quite likely you'll do it wrong and you will definitely get the wrong answer. And there's probably, I don't know, millions of people have been killed by uh, statistics. And I read something that was probably on Twitter, because the only thing I ever read is on Twitter nowadays. In the last few hours, uh, somebody's saying, you know, to be a surgeon, you, they won't let you operate on a patient until you've done loads of training and your competence has been really thoroughly assessed. But people can do statistical analysis of research and publish it in a way that then influences what surgeons do or other people do without any kind of check of that competence. So it kind of makes you think a bit. And the other thing that academics are great, this, this bullet point I've highlighted here about more stringent thresholds for claiming discoveries or successes. Academics, we all love to big ourselves up, don't we? We all love to say, well, you know, you do know me, I discovered uh, whatever. I haven't, I haven't discovered anything, so I can't, I can't, I can't say. You know, or, you know um, and that's where you get your Nobel Prizes and, and that's where you get your university doing press releases saying you've found cures for cancer or cures for wounds or cures for anything. Um, there's a real concern in a lot of the scientific community at the moment that there are no real... Um, we, we don't police that sort of thing very well and there's a huge amount of overclaiming goes on and press releases which overclaim the magnificence of an academic's research that gets picked up by the Daily Mail or the Sun, or the, and then that's a headline, and that, you know, there's a lot of disease mongering goes on, there's a lot of fake, you know, to, well, not fake, but far too early claims for cures for things that aren't really, we don't even know for cures for things yet, and it's one study and it's 12 people, and, you know, so we've really got to be a bit hotter on that, and these other things. So, you know, if we adhere to a lot of these issues more closely as a community, and become less hoodwinked as users of research by some of this stuff, we'll um, be less likely to be using, producing and then using false findings. And so from my own experience, um, I, so my research is mainly in wound care. And w wound care research is not great. It's getting better. We've got evidence to show it's getting better, but it's not great. So I run the Cochrane Wounds uh, Group, so we do systematic reviews of wounds interventions, which means we look at the quality of the primary studies all the time. And so um, this is a study that we uh, published in the journal called Trials in 2014. And we, we looked at 167 trials in wound care. And uh, well, first to say their uh, follow-up duration was really short. Now, these sorts of wounds, the leg ulcers, foot ulcers, they take months to heal. So following somebody up for 12 weeks, you're not going to capture the healing. Measuring the size reduction doesn't, it's not really a very good way of assessing a treatment. And the median sample size of these studies was 63, which is tiny. That's a pilot study. Uh, but then what these bars show is, um, so basically, these are quality criteria for a good trial. Did they define the primary outcome for the study at the beginning? Did they follow people to complete healing? Did they do the randomization properly, so it's a properly randomized trial? And did they blind the people assessing the treatment outcomes to the intervention? Now, really, all of these should reach 100. And, you know, complete, uh, well, sequence, you know, these weren't even properly randomized, probably. So about 75% of those studies weren't properly randomized. Um, 
you know, and defining a primary outcome. There's absolutely no excuse for not doing that, but so many aren't. So, got a real problem. So, I can say, you know, in terms of wounds research, John Ioannidis is bang on. Most of the uh, findings are likely to be false. So, I like this. I know, well, no idea whoever said it. I'll, I won't read it out to you. So it's about learning from other people's mistakes so um, we don't make the same ones. And again, I think, I'm saying how these are brilliant professions to be in to do research. Uh, because medicine has got such a running start on us and has made all the mistakes under the sun and still makes them in their research, um, we can learn from that and do much better and avoid the repetition of the mistakes which is great. How to make more research useful? Well, there's, a, there's a, going to be a recurring theme for all, the answer to all these questions is always, well, first of all, you do a systematic review or update a systematic review or just check that there is one and use that. You know, you don't have to do it, but often there will be one and you need to read it really carefully, either for practice or for research because they reviewed all the research. And they've identified all the mistakes of the previous research so that you can learn from it. The other thing we need to do when we're embarking on new research is make sure that it, it addresses a real information need. And you are the best people to be able to do that. Much better place than me. So information needs are patients, clinical decision makers, policy makers. Variations in practice are a good signal for uncertainty as well. Um, because these are the real-life questions that research should be addressing so that we can reduce that uncertainty. Um, we need to do research in big teams with the right skills, the statisticians, you know, whoever it is we need. Replication, again, good and important. Measure the things that are meaningful and valid. We've been often bad at that. Uh, in medicine are terrible. I think we're probably a lot... Are there any medics in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Better check. Okay. Well, well, if you are, you're very sensibly keeping quiet about it. Um, medicine are terrible at measuring things that you think, well, why is that important? It's interesting to you, but why is it important? But we, I think we're much better at measuring patient-focused, health service user-focused outcomes that matter and that are going to tell us something that's meaningful, that we can interpret and use as a basis for our decisions. We need to make sure research is big enough, but um, actually, I'm not, this isn't just about quantitative research. And I think qualitative research is often particularly bad. Qualitative researchers are often particularly bad at learning from what's gone before and ignoring it. And uh, so you'll see a million studies on a similar theme that don't reference the million studies before on the similar theme. Patients' experiences of, patients like living with X. Um, so, but also, um, in, in terms of qualitative research, size isn't everything, obviously. You don't want huge qualitative studies, usually. You want deep qualitative studies that interrogate that rich information very deeply. And very often, they don't. So, depending on where you, what, what sort of research you're looking at, it's got to be big enough or it's got to be deep enough. And it's also got to be grounded in the real world. Again, um, learning from, from our medical colleagues, um, with good reason, often for drug regulation, that were, they were awash with placebo-controlled trials. And the placebo-controlled trial of a drug will show you whether that drug is better than nothing. But for most of the things that we deal with, obviously we're not, it's not let's do this or nothing. It's shall we do this or shall we do this alternative thing? And so we need to make sure we're designing pragmatic studies that reflect the real world, that if we're doing comparative studies, that compare things with the real alternative that would be the alternative. And that we publish things to proper reporting standards, which there are many different types now for many different types of study. Then, um, will it get you... Oh, I've gone on. I've to, I've got, I go on too long. OK. We need to make sure the research gets used 
Okay, we know that nurses, midwives, and allied health professions don't use the research necessarily. We know that practice, uh, and we certainly know that doctors don't. So in the USA, only about half the care is in line with recommendations, and that's as low as 11% of the care for people with alcohol dependence. Uh, we have few studies looking at that in nursing and the therapies, uh, because often we've got relatively few benchmarks of evidence-based best practice to benchmark against. Or if we have, it's very labour-intensive to collect the data comparing real practice with that benchmark. But more evidence is emerging. We certainly know that nurses, midwives and AHPs feel uh, often a lack of confidence in using and interpreting research. We can look at variations in care as a signal of uncertainty. And this is uh, from the Greater Manchester Clark and Anila McAvoy is here with a stand downstairs. I'll go and talk to them about the Clark work. Um, uh, the percentage of people across Greater Manchester, these, these bars are each different CCGs or different, uh, well, there were CCGs then, I think the, the, there's been some changes since we collected the data, but the proportion of patients with a complex wound with an antimicrobial dressing on. And you can see, th so these, are the, the, uh, these colours here are all different sorts of antimicrobial dressing. What this slide shows you is a massive variation by CCG in the use of antimicrobial dressings. Now, there isn't any evidence that putting these antimicrobial dressings on a complex wound makes any difference whatsoever. It may do. So we've got huge uncertainty, and that's evidenced by huge differences in practice, big differences in the use of silver dressings, which are very, very expensive. So we need more research to inform that practice. Then we need to make sure we get it used. I'm very interested in communities of practice. These are people who share a concern, a set of problems, or a passion about a topic. And healthcare professionals delivering care and researchers generally work in distinct, different communities of practice. We know that knowledge is very well transmitted within communities of practice, but doesn't very well jump between them, which is why clinical academics are so important, because they speak both languages and um, cross that boundary. Healthcare professionals don't necessarily see research findings as a solution to their real world problems either. So we know that's true. And that's research done at the University of Manchester in the business school. Really, really good research. So we need to close the gap between research and practice. There are all these things that we know have some effect, but there's no magic bullet. We need to collaborate more between practitioners and researchers. Not only because we think um, that we'll do better research, but also if we work closely together, we eliminate that gap. It benefits practice and it benefits the researchers. We can produce not research evidence together and that's more likely to be used. And we also think, but it's not proven, that if we have a research culture, we're, um, it's, we're more likely to use the research done by other people, not just the research that we've been involved in, because we're research ready, we understand the importance of it, we get it. And the NIHR is all about research by the NHS for the NHS. It's brilliant. The biggest funding scheme, the main funding scheme we've got. And Clark's particularly in NIHR programme grants are have to be embedded in the health service. The money comes into the health service. Research capability funding in large amounts comes into the health service as a consequence of these sorts of grants. But they are required to be about co-production of research evidence. So moving away from a, a, this idea that there's a knowledge gap, that, oh, us academics are producing all this research, and why aren't you lot using it? I mean, come on, get on with it. It's moving away from that. and moving it on to thinking about working together, developing people with the skills who can bridge the gap between the communities of practice, and we call them boundary spanners. They can do knowledge transfer. They speak both languages. They're bilingual. So very quickly, I'm trying to draw to a close, but um, a case study of somebody I've worked with for a lot of years called Sarah. So my research collaboration with her then a clinical nurse specialist began in the 1990s. And initially she was a site lead for a randomised control trial we were doing. And then she got the bug for research, so studied for an evidence-based practice MSc. 
And then as she matured as a researcher as well as a, a, a nurse specialist, we developed this solid research collaboration which was bi-directional. In other words, she was bringing research questions and working with us on the answers. It wasn't about us going and saying, we'd like to research this. Can we persuade you? She, the questions became her questions. And that led to, well, it's probably more now since I wrote this slide, 35 papers in PubMed, a paper in the uh, Lancet and the BMJ, or three in the Lancet and the BMJ, numerous Cochrane reviews, it's more than that now for RCT funding in which she was a co-investigator. She's a named author on all these papers, three programme grants. And we have evidence that the practice there was better than normal across that huge patch because of that research environment. And I think that's because that was rooted research. It wasn't parachute, parachute research. It was coming from the bottom up. It was co-production. She was generating the questions. Crucially, she had senior management support at that time. It was a trust, a community trust with research aspirations. And that senior support, which we see huge evidence of today, is crucial. You can't really do it without. So she's become a real boundary spanner who understands both cultures, languages, but is clinically credible. Has power, authority and ability to influence the staff on the ground and the senior management in the trust. And you can see if that's all working really well, that's brilliant and that's how it should be. So, final slide, sorry for going on a bit. Um, new research should be preceded by a good synthesis of the, the existing research and we need to avoid the mistakes of the past. We need to do better research. We need to make sure that we address the questions that are important to the end users we need to get better at dissemination. I could, I could have given a whole talk about how we disseminate research very badly, usually. Follow evidence for everyday nursing on Twitter and blog. Brilliant. Um, uh, and closer collaboration between researchers and practitioners, in other words, clinical academics. We need more boundary spanners and we need more co-production of research. Thank you very much. Time left for that thing. One minute. Let me sit down. Thank, thank you very much, Nikki. I've never been referred to as a spanner before. Thank you. <laughs> I quite like the idea of being a boundary spanner. Um, we've got about one minute for any burning questions, but I might push it to a couple of minutes. You never know. Any questions for Nikki? Or challenges? Or arguments? <laughs> No. Comments, complaints? <coughs> Any thoughts? Oh, go on. Oh, yeah. go on, Helen. I'll ask a question or a challenge. So when you were talking about um, the quality of good research, initially I thought, oh, it's a bit scary this because part of changing the culture is just getting people engaged in research, even if it's not of the highest quality. Um, it was just, just really to comment on that because I think it's just encouraging people to take the plunge, shall we say, and it might be a very small study but, and we don't want to put them off. That's a really, really good question. Look, I don't think anybody should or even does embark on any piece of work, whether it's research or anything, with the idea of doing a bad job or doing something a bit crap. Um, I think, excuse my vernacular, so I think, I think we shouldn't do poor research, but something can be small and beautiful, and small and rigorous, and at least if you're doing a small piece of research, and if, if it's qualitative research, that's really quite straightforward, if you're doing, maybe you're trying to pilot something, you know that in doing that, you're doing that with a vision of where this is going to lead to, I think that's the thing, it's got to be leading somewhere that you know is going to be uh, maybe a few years away, but you know it's going to be robust, potentially useful, valid, likely to be, you know, so it's where you're going to. You know, lots of research starts off quite tentatively, um, you know, and maybe a bit scruffily, but we have to do things as carefully and as rigorous as we can, uh, given the scale of thing we're able to do. Thank you. Oh, oh. Uh, oh. just started a, started a trend, Helen.
Uh, hi, Sue Langley. Um, thank you very much. That was um, really interesting. Just really to follow on from um, Helen's question, um, the day-to-day -day reality of clinical practice now is uh, things need to be done quickly, um, everybody's really, really busy. So how can academics help with the research process. I've done some research myself. It is a lengthy process, you know, an IRAS form, consent, all of those kind of things. So sometimes it, the research process doesn't fit into the day-to-day -day reality that we need to do the research. And it's just really how can, how can academics help with that, really? Well, I'm not sure that academics' role is to help fit the research into your the kinds of work things you've yeah, just talked no, no, about no. Uh, I can't do your IRAS form for no, you no no or, no or, absolutely or, but, or it, do, do but the consent. it's um, we obviously we need to well it's part of co-production isn't it if we're doing that properly together we wouldn't design research that would be unfeasible in the clinical setting so I think it is about designing that research together that you know can be done yes Feasibility it, it, it's about the doability and the other thing I would say very quickly is um the benefit of NIHR funding is the research capability funding, which, is which goes into the NHS, it doesn't come to the university, and it is supposed to help with all that kind of stuff. So it helps with bringing extra capacity into the trust for things, for, for I guess part of which will be personnel to support IRAS forms and um, consent, and there's the CRNs helping recruit, and consent people, all that kind of thing. So um, th there are systems available to help with that. But I think if we did the research more closely together and planned it from the outset more closely together, I think we would work that through before we even started, okay. is my hope. Thank you. Oh, there's, an, oh, there's another question. Oh, there. One more question, and then um, I'm acutely aware that we, we then need to move on with the programme. So. Um, sorry, it was it was more about the sort of dissemination and, and getting things into clinical practice. Um, how how and what do you think we can do about um, members of the clinical team who are very good clinically, but would stand there and say research is not what I'm good at. I'm not an academic, and that's that's not what I'm there for. To the to the point where where some people would are sort of like, oh, I can't read a journal article. That's far too scary. Yeah, I've got loads of sympathy with that. I don't think everybody should be doing research at all, um, and, uh, but everybody should be using it. But, the, but I think people like me have a responsibility to disseminate it, clearly. So there's these brilliant things called blog shots. I'll tweet some um, when I um, uh, sit down. Um, done by the UK Cochrane Centre, Sarah Chapman there, who basically summarises a whole systematic review in what's like a small PowerPoint slide, which gives the answer. And that's what we need to be able to do. We need to be able to take all the complication out of it. And if there's a clear message that needs to be heard by practice, we need to disseminate that really clearly. I think mainly the reason why researchers like me don't write clearly is because they don't really know what they're trying to say very often, because they don't really know what the results mean. So they kind of work it through in real time in a paper, rather than deciding what they're going to say before they write it, and then writing it really clearly, which is what I try and teach people to do. Thank you very much. It's been a great audience. I'll see you later.